Thank you for joining us today. Um, the first half of this um, session will be on um, just like, you know, current and emerging um, treatment options for sickle cell disease. And so we'll, we'll talk about you know, what the current treatment options for sickle cell disease are, and then also um, what's on the horizon for sickle cell. Um, and, you know, there's a lot within the pipeline for sickle right. cell. It's an exciting time right, right now. Um, it's never exciting to be a sickle cell patient, but it's ex exciting to see that we're going to possibly have options right. for the future, hopefully soon. So um, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the second half, I'll open it up to your guys' questions um, um, that you could hopefully get answered by Dr. Crollo. Am I missing anything? Yeah, you went to a meeting. You just oh, got back. I did. I went to the um, SCBAA <laughs> national meeting. I got this shirt. This is from um, Hertz. Um, or he, he goes by Nas now. Um, and it says Sickle Cell Matters. It has his iconic artwork on it. Um, so please, he has an Amazon account. Go visit it. Support him. Also, it was a great meeting. Mm -hmm. Really, really uh, robust information <laughs> and just a good group of people. So um, thumbs up to uh, you know Beverly and SCDA and everybody who put their hard work and effort mm -hmm. into it. So these are the questions you guys sent in from last week. So. What are the possible treatment options um, for chronic pain and sickle cell complications currently right now? So chronic pain is a really big problem. It's a huge problem, in fact, basically because it's so hard to treat. And it's so common in sickle cell disease. Uh, and part of that is the fact that people with sickle cell disease receive opioids for pain management. And anybody who's on opioids for um, a long period of time can sometimes end up having issues with chronic pain that are actually somewhat associated with the opioids. Chronic pain is described in medicine as somebody who has pain for three months solid. So if you have pain for a couple of weeks or a month or whatever, Ever, until it's three months of pain com consecutively, then that's not really considered chronic pain by people in medicine. Um, chronic pain can uh, be neurologic pain because if you have sickle cell disease, of course, you have ischemia or low oxygen, and that can damage your nervous system. And so some sickle cell chronic pain is neuropathic pain. And oh, yeah, I wanted to ask what is like most common cr chronic pain in sickle cell? Is that normally like joint pain or like what is chronic pain well, look like in sickle cell disease? Yeah, I mean, well, there's two different things. There's chronic pain, like if you have AVM, so okay. you have chronic pain from AVM. So yes. that's really, that's, uh, that's, a kind, <laughs> that's a kind of pain that is not generally speaking would be called neuro neuropathic pain, but it could be if it lasted long enough. But that's actually something, you know, physically wrong with you that can be fixed. So if you have really bad AVN and you're, you're limping and you have immobility, um, you can have surgery and have a hip replacement. You may still have some pain after that, but it could, it, it might just go away. Chronic pain is generally, it can be specific to a certain area, but I think most people with chronic pain have pain not in one place, but migrating all over their body or their whole body hurts, oh, okay. or they just feel like they're having a sickle cell of, uh, pain episode all the time and it just doesn't really get better. I don't know where I read this, but there was a uh, actually kind of a young woman who had a bone marrow transplant, and she had chronic pain, and it wasn't affected by the transplant. So she had chronic pain after the bone before marrow. the before? transplant, and when she got the transplant, then it just continued. Just chronic continue. pain. Okay. Even people who, even people who, eventually are pain free after a transplant, it can take three to six months to 
in for order your body to, to fully for, for, right. kind of... Well, because you, your, your nervous system is, has what's called plasticity. And so your nervous system can actually change in response to pain or, or other things. So it takes a while for your body to sort of readjust to not right. having pain. And that takes three months. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of a long At time. Three, three months to me sounds short after, like, you yeah, know, living well, a life full of sickle cell. Yeah, right. yeah. But, so. it, but it, it could be frustrating if you thought you were going to get a bone marrow transplant, went through all that, and pain just Got disappeared. You know? okay. Even, and with transfusions, it can, it can take, even longer. So anyway, so basically, if you have chronic pain, most people would say there's a neuropathic component to that. So there's neuropathic means some nerve damage, or or your uh, nervous system is in uh, has changed so that you ha have what's called hyperalgesia, where opioids actually cause pain. The more opioids you get, the more pain you have, or allergies where a slight touch really kind of is painful. And, you know, I can recall people who, while they were in the hospital for a pain episode, they would not want to wear their gown. They didn't want to wear anything because things touching their skin was really irritating. Yeah. And that would be considered allodynia. So, so neuro, neuropathic pain or pain that's caused by damage or change to your nerves that can that does not respond to opioids. In fact, if you take opioids, in some cases, it can, it can make it worse. Yes. And there's tolerance and hyperalgesia. Tolerance, everybody who's on opioids gets. So if you take opioids for a few days or a week, you realize this dose that was working for me initially just doesn't cut it anymore. Right. And if you increase the dose, the pain goes away. So that's tolerance. Hyperalgesia is you increase the dose, right. You increase the dose, it nothing happens, or it gets even worse. Yeah. And so then that is then that some people, um, Tom Coates down in LA. I've gone to a couple of talks by him, and he and I think he's right that hyperalgesia is equivalent to neuropathic pain because there's a neuropathic element to that. You're Plasticity of your your uh, nervous system has has created a change, and you're no longer having pain in response to tissue injury. You're having you're you're responding to in a hyper way to the same amount of pain, or even less pain. And maybe your pain's getting better, and the ischemia, the tissue damage is healing, but you're still having pain. pain right. So in that case, you have to take something other than an opioid. And a lot of people will prescribe a combination of something like um, Neurontin, Gabapentin, or other medications along with pain medications kind of to treat, you know, opioid-induced pain plus this neuropathic pain. But I think the idea is, so there's Gabapentin, which is Neurontin, uh, Lycra, which is pre-Gabulin, and then, and then anti, those are anti-seizure medicines. All these work on your nervous system. And then there's antidepressants like amitriptyline, nortriptyline, and uh, Cymbalta, which is a SSRI inhibitor. So those are the kind of medications that people would prescribe for neuropathic pain. At the same time, personally, I think you have to do something about sickle cell disease. So I wanted to, okay, so just to go uh, dive deeper into the, uh, that question, current treatment options are very limited for right. sickle cell disease. Right. And to my knowledge, they are, you know, um, prevention through transfusion, right. you know, you know a, acute or chronic transfusion, right. um, hydroxyurea, which is, you know, it's mm -hmm. been around since, our, been approved for high, uh, sickle cell disease since 1998. Um, newly approved L-glutamine, mm -hmm. um, which was approved in 2017, and then um, treating your pain through pain management, which is all, uh, which is opioids. Right. So for 
Am I missing right. anything? No, there, no, there no. Are four You're right. That's what's available for, right now. Or sickle cell disease right, right, right. as of right now. So right. we don't have too many options no. to treat sickle cell disease. You may after February, but right now we don't. <laughs> Fingers crossed, y'all. Fingers crossed. Um, so, um, so, so what I'm thinking is what you need to do, you need to, you need to do something about the sickle cell disease. So some people will put uh, people on chronic transfusions during the time that they're starting this treatment for neuropathic pain or treatment for some other pain where people are taking a lot of opioids. But the thing with that is, is you have to think about if, if you get about, I don't think transfusions are good, but they're not as good as a bone marrow transplant. I mean, right? the bone marrow transplant is essentially the cure, yeah, right? Yeah, right, right. So but just not accessible to everybody. Right. So if you so if you just so if you're so if, if you're a physician or you want to treat your chronic pain and see if you can't wean yourself off of opioids because you're tired of taking them and it's they you're just over it and, or and you don't want to be on any medicine then you'd have to imagine that you'd have to be in a chronic transfusions for a minimum of three months minimum okay probably more more like six and, or even somewhat longer and i've had people who were on chronic transfusions for pain and it really just it didn't work but if you it's one option or try hydroxyurea whatever you're doing either and hydroxyurea itself that takes before it even starts it takes three to six months to even start working so if you were going to use hydroxyurea and you're having chronic pain you think well maybe i'll have to be on hydroxyurea for a year before it really kicks in and does anything um and during that i mean there's a lot of psycho psychology that goes into this and because you 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 experience pain in your brain so and a lot of things affect the way you experience pain and if you come into this with a negative attitude like I won't use the expletive that a lot of people use, but this <laughs> this is not going to work. It probably won't work. If you come into it with the attitude is, I really think this is going to work, and it'll, maybe it doesn't work for other people. It's going to work for me, and I'm going to make it work. If that's your attitude, then probably your, your chances of having it work are much better because you're you have a positive My attitude. Is, uh, your mindset is really important so what you'd have to do would be to start one of those drugs i talked to an anti-seizure antidepressant be on some other therapy hydroxyurea transfusions at the same time that you're on opioids and you would have to have some kind of a schedule to decrease the opioids over the period of time that you were on the, whatever the therapy was Transfusion, hydroxyurea, whatever, and then and you and you, it's it's a team effort between you, a psychologist, social worker, your physician, to figure out what do you really want out of this therapy. Do you want to be completely off of opioids, nothing? Do you want your pain to go away? That's assuming people are like I'm not on op opioids, yeah. so um, that wouldn't be. Uh, necessarily treatment unless it's just acutely right yeah so but these we're talking about people are taking opioids every single day which is about it's about five or ten percent of people okay. with sickle cell okay. and you know so it, there's nothing particularly wrong with opioids but if you have to keep increasing the dose and you're still having pain that's, that's an issue that's hard, you know? yeah. so that's what you're treating um anyway so it's a long process I think it takes planning ahead of time. You have to have anticipation. You have to really commit yourself to months or a year or some long period of treatment to get rid of that pain. And and you have to sort of, you know, you have to decide when are you going to decide that, it, that this isn't working, you know. Although it really, if you're if you're behind it, it should it should work. To some degree, even if you have less pain and you're still taking the opioids or something. Okay, that's about all I can say. <laughs> it's right. a really hard problem. It is. It's the 
it's it's probably the most difficult problem in sickle cell. Is um, pain, chronic pain, chronic the treatment pain. of chronic pain, and getting people because and the other thing is, you really if if you feel like you've had pain, you don't wait for three months and say, oh, oh, it's been three months now, I have chronic pain. You anticipate I've had pain for three weeks, a month, whatever, and I'm worried, I want to do something about this. Because at some point, if you've had chronic pain for a year or two years, I don't know how long, a long time, the chances of you reversing that become less likely the longer you yeah. are, years into you know, chronic opioids, it's, it's difficult. One thing I also uh, learned when I was out in Baltimore um, last week was there are patients who, um, and this is probably a minority, but there are patients who don't know, it's not that they don't know how to differentiate between sickle cell pain and other pain, mm -hmm. but it's like they take the oh. medicine for like a headache, for right, a crisis, right, right, for right, you know, just right. every pain that they have, they're taking the, the narcotics or the opioids and therefore building a tolerance. Right. And so I think it's important to be able to differentiate, hey, if you have a headache, take ibuprofen or right. Tylenol. If you have, you know, cell right. pain, you If know. it's your time of the month, don't take opioids because you have cramps. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Right. But that is part of the psychological part of the pain thing. So that's called, uh, it could be someone who, I can't pronounce this correctly, but catastrophizes. Oh, catastrophizes. Yeah. yeah. So you you everything is like a catastrophe, and you don't differentiate a headache, hip pain from ABN, and bone pain from your sickle cell is all the Are same. All the, They're on all the same. The same. Level. I can't stand to be in pain. I'm gonna take a lot of it for a headache, you know, which probably you know would wouldn't really work that well. But but that is one of the psychological problems that you have to work with the other thing is the people who have pain have depression there's just you may there's say a direct link there's it, a right? direct biochemical link between depression and pain and pain and depression people who have pain you may not recognize it as depression or you may not accept it as depression but you if you've had pain for three, if i had pain for three i can't even stand pain for three minutes yeah <laughs> three right. months you know right. so you would be depressed because you think you know you, i'm always going to be in pain what's the deal here i yeah. can't live like this so um you need to have some kind of therapy some kind of antidepressant if you have chronic pain and the, the, the reverse of that is is people who have depression develop chronic pain mm -hmm. because the the pathways are so similar. So, if you have if you have chronic pain or you have a lot of pain, it doesn't have to be three months of pain. You should really talk to somebody about yeah how you feel about it. Yeah. Some some of the comments say um, um, I guess alternative ways to treat pain: heating pad and take your mind somewhere other than on your. Oh, pain. those uh, are good ideas. Yeah, and. Definitely therapy. Yeah. For you know, for so I think pain. for acute pain or pain that's not chronic pain, alternate therapies are work way better than most. Well, for sure. So doctors. acute pain There's, is like what, like a pain crisis? Yeah, correct? like having or, a pain crisis, or you've had a pain crisis and you're out of the hospital, but I don't think anyone leaves the hospital and they're pain free at the end when they no. get discharged. Yeah. But distraction, like. A, the big thing now is virtual reality, where you put on this little thing. I haven't tried that, but I'd like to. <laughs> and, yeah. and well, it used to be. This is what really was pretty common when I was working at Children's. Would be that a patient would come in and they would be listening to music, playing a video game, or watching television. And somebody, not this is, you know, could be a resident, doctor, or somebody, would say, well, that patient can't be in pain. They're sitting there playing a video game. They're, they're in here. They're malingering. They're playing. They're, they're watching TV. They're watching Oprah, and they're totally not. look. They don't look like they're in pain to me. They should be out of here. 
but that's part of the distraction. Yeah, so right. distraction while you're doing it may decrease the pain a little bit. And seriously, people with sickle cell disease do not demonstrate all the things that I would demonstrate if I was having your pain. I wouldn't be sitting there kind of composed and, well, I have, I have to confess, I have kidney stones. I've had them like 50 times, and I'll tell you, I was not sitting in the emergency room with total composure saying, you know, talking like, you know, I try to think to myself, I've got to do, if sickle cell patients can handle this, I can handle it well. <laughs> well, we're really <laughs> <laughs> very it's not but true. what I will say is I admire people who can like remain composed yeah when they're and some because people I'm can... not that person I am not. I just but, for me for a crisis it feels like the first time every single time uh, like it's just I'm rolling on the floor uh, I'm like acting like a three-year-old I don't care about what my hair looks I don't care about what like you know like the tears and the snot dripping down my nose I don't care about that because when you're in that amount of pain, you just don't care about right. like little societal like the, all that becomes trivial. So right, you just don't care I, what I people act think. Wild I wild you know. when I'm in that amount of pain. So yeah. and, but some people and, are very stoic, and I know they're having pain, and they just they, they have pain. their brain can yeah. just like clamp it down. Okay. Okay. So switching gears here to like okay. what what we are. I guess what treatment options are um, hopefully becoming available soon. Okay. So the first one is um, that is being talked about a lot is gene therapy. Um, so the question is, what is gene therapy, and what is um, is the difference between gene therapy and gene editing? And then um, just to put add a layer to that question, uh, there's a 60 minutes segment on sickle cell disease right. and how. Uh, uh, gene therapy was used in an HIV vector right. um, to cure sickle cell disease. So a lot of patients took that, or a lot of individuals, I should say, um, took that and um, didn't like that they're using HIV to cure right. sickle cell and um, thought that you're trading one thing for another. And, you know, I've, I heard comments like, you know, they're trying to wipe us out. Um, I've heard comments like, you know, they're trying to of us HIV. Can you explain a little bit yeah. of, about what that was about? And, I'm smiling. And gene therapy? I'm smiling. It's a very it's real concern. Funny. Like you don't it's start HIV concern. out there and be, expect people to be it happy. Was, you know what I mean? You know that wasn't a yeah. very well edited little piece. Of that yeah, thing, there needs to know? be education around. It, I honestly. mean, when he said that, they should have somebody. They should have explained what he meant by that. Yeah. In a more detailed fashion. So basically, there's two different kinds of gene therapy. There's gene editing and there's um, gene insertion. Gene editing is the CRISPR case nine thing that you're about and it's not that's not really on the horizon very much because those it takes two um, proteins in order to do that. One has to take out the bad gene and then, and then the other one puts put in the good like gene. And that's really a big cut paste. That, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's big and it won't fit. It won't fit in the virus vector. The question is, how do you get that? So into when the you say it's too big and it won't fit in the virus vector, it, it, at least the me if I'm, virus. Correct me if I'm all right. So yeah. the virus vector mm -hmm. um, is kind of the vehicle to deliver exactly. this and correct the genetic right. material, and so. Because you have so much genetic material that needs to be switched out or needs to be exchanged, mm -hmm. you need kind of like a big vector in order right. to do that. And HIV has the right size vehicle or vector to be able to do that. Oh, so the so, so the it's I wouldn't call it's called the Lenti virus. It's okay. not HIV, and so it's it's a virus that is has been modified in the laboratory to not be a HIV virus. So right. they actually, with gene editing, they can not only edit our genes, they can edit the virus genes. So they do that. They eliminate genes and add genes so that the so that, that virus does what they want it to do. Yeah. And the unique thing about HIV and why it's so deadly is that it can insert its genes into your genes. 
And so Which that is what is, makes it perfect in this situation, right? right? And right. correcting the gene in sickle cell. Yeah. So, yeah. and, you know, people thought about that. Well, HIV can, you know, insert genes. What if we insert hemoglobin genes for people with sickle cell? That'd be great. Yeah. And it took, a, you know, it took years and years and years of research to do this. So what, the, what this virus is, it has components of the HIV in order to be able to put this hemoglobin gene into your genome. But the replication, but you know, the virus has to replicate and it has to insert its own DNA or RNA into your genome in order for it to be um, a, a pathogen. And so that part has been eliminated from the virus. So there is nothing harmful. No. You wouldn't get any harmful aspect of, no. you know, HIV. You're not going to get not HIV. Even, not, not even remotely yeah. close. And okay. the other thing is the part, the, 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 the machinery in the virus that allows it to replicate is taken out. Okay. So once it inserts the hemoglobin, it just sort of disintegrates. It, uh, so it doesn't no remain virus. in your body. No. Or... Well, you can you can you can find all the little pieces and parts probably with antibodies and other you know um, you know looking around you could find it, but it would not be the virus. It Got would it. be just the remnant, <coughs> the remnants. So, so gene insertion means it takes a special hemoglobin, um, you know, the hemoglobin gene, and it inserts it into your genome. So, but it doesn't do, it, it's not like it, it puts it in any, it doesn't put it in the same place where your hemoglobin is now. It just puts it into your genome. Okay. So all over, you know, you've got thousands and thousands of genes. So inserted in between all these genes is hemoglobin genes. Okay. And they make hemoglobin. I see. Right, and so, in the in the progenitor cells to to um, to the the red cell, it's inserted into the to, into that area, and the and the red and those progenitors start making hemoglobin, and you end up with a red cell that contains normal hemoglobin. hemoglobin. And in the in the Bluebird Bio study, what they actually did was they changed, they tweaked the hemoglobin a little bit so that it had some. Um, uh, characteristics of fetal hemoglobin so it inhibits sickling a little bit. Okay. And they can also track the hemoglobin because it's not exactly the same as normal hemoglobin A. I see. So in other words, if you, you know, part of the protocol for uh, the study is to be transfused up so that you're, when you go into it, you're not, your cell cell um, blood is it's really a minimum, low yeah, as a minimum. And they also have to do that to collect your stem cells that makes it safer. But um, so they can track how much, what percent of your, what percent of the hemoglobin, like, because the, the blood transfusion is going to last for a couple of months, what percent of the hemoglobin is transfused blood and what percent of it is from the bluebird bio. And that's the only one I know. There are other ones, but that's the only one I'm familiar with. Is in your is circulating, and so the problem with that is it's not really a problem because they've done a lot to fix it. But one of the issues is well, what if it inserts it into a bad place, like mm -hmm. in front of an oncogene or a cancer causing gene? Well, they've modified the way this um, vi viral vector inserts it to to decrease or almost eliminate that. So that's po it's possible, but it's not. It's not very probable, um, and there's a, there are other uh, viral vectors. The other issue that that aren't well, I don't want to say this, but they probably aren't as good as Bluebird Bio. Bluebird Bio, they've had a lot of experience with this, and there are other gene therapies that are similar, but they some of them haven't had the success that Bluebird Bio. Some of them have, some of them haven't. Um, and one of the issues is how the vector has to infect the cells in order for it to be functional. Mm -hmm. So you have to have enough of the vector in, inserting it, inserting this hemoglobin gene into the progenitor cells in order that when you do the 
the transplanter, when you infuse those cells into the recipient, that you actually are making enough hemoglobin. And that's now probably the biggest issue, is can how many of those vectors will actually infect cells and when the progenitor cells, and when you give them back to the recipient, how quickly will they start making normal hemoglobin? And in some studies, um, that it was actually just recorded, there was a redo in blood, I think this month actually, and, and in some of those studies, they just didn't get enough vector into the recipient. And there's, and that's, and that, I don't, I can't remember when the actual paper was written, but it was just published. There's been about 250 people who have gotten these, this gene therapy around the world and through, with all these studies. And then, the, like I said, the, that technically, I mean, if everything works, well and goes mm -hmm. fine mm -hmm. would technically be a cure for sickle cell That's disease. That's a cure, yeah. Okay. I mean, that means the, 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 the issues, the two to me, first, the two issues or three is what is the viral number? How many viruses actually get in there and change? That's really important. The uh, where do they go? Is there issues with that? Could there be, you know, if you've given this to 250 people, well, what if you give it to 250,000 people? I mean, what, that's, what you know, something's going to, you know, the more you give it, the more you find out about right. the side effects. So is there ever a problem with where it inserts? And then the other thing is durability. How long does this last? Yeah. I mean, if you get it when you're 10, and it lasts well, till to, you're 30, okay. you know, that's good, but it's no, not no. a cure. So until this has been around for, you know, longer than it's been around, and people can confidently say this is a durable cure that will last your lifetime, that's, you know, then, then you've cured it. It's like with, with stem cell transplant or progenitor cell transplant, there are people who have had who are twenty plus years old and you know it's still they're still, they're still functioning and yeah. they're cured. Um, so that's kind of the and the gene editing. I'll just quickly so gene so that's gene insertion. Gene editing is this uh, relatively newly discovered proteins where one of the proteins goes and recognizes the the the, the ends of each side of a of a gene and then cuts that gene out. Mm -hmm. And then the other um, protein goes in there and, and inserts the, correct, the gene. correct gene in the correct place. Mm -hmm. So not only is the gene... It's more precise. It's very precise. And mm -hmm. the, the issues with that is, is you know, the when you have a gene insertion, there's what's called off-target effects, where the gene goes in where maybe you didn't expect it to go. If you have a gene editing system and you have off-target effects, it's not going to remove the hemoglobin gene, it's going to remove a different gene, which could not be good. You know, mm, there's a lot right. of genes that don't do too much, right. but could that could be a problem. And and they just don't, nobody has a real handle on, does, that, does it ever occur? And if it does, is, is it an extremely rare event? Or what? But anyway, that's the difference between those two. Somebody asked specifically about voxelator. Um, mm -hmm. My understanding of voxelator is it, um, it's a, I guess, a disease modifying um, once a day oral um, therapy. And um, what it does is it, um, and maybe I should, you go should, ahead. you should probably go, go ahead, ahead and. You, no, no, you tell, you, because it'll help. you tell me what you think it does. Um, um, my understanding is it prevents um, red blood cells from ever sickling. And so um, if you get enough red blood cells that don't ever sickle, it's kind of like living with sickle cell trait. Yeah, sort of. Sort of, right. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, so Veloxator or... Uh, Voxelator. Voxelator. <laughs> is a very small molecule and it goes into the red blood cell mm -hmm. and it attaches to the hemoglobin right. and changes the shape instead of it just kind of like changes the shape of the hemoglobin to look like it's oxygenated. 
So, so it's not carrying it oxygen. It's, it's awesome. not carrying oxygen. It's carrying a, this little molecule that that tweaks tweaks it to look like it's a oxygen. Normal red blood cell. Right. Yeah. But, well, no, just like a, oh. the, the oxygen that hemoglobin molecule has changed its shape and it looks like it's carrying oxygen. Oh. And so oxygenated sickle cell hemoglobin does not sickle. Right. It only sickles when you release the oxygen and then it changes the configuration and it's able to make these long polymers. Right. So That's this impressive. prevents those long polymers from being generated in the red cells. So, so it prevents like cells from becoming crescent right, shape and spin. Right. And, and it and it, you know, there's a there's something called the delay time. There's a there's different ways that that chain could be made. And so it really just disrupts all that from happening. And the, and the consequence is, is that you don't have as much hemolysis. The spread cells don't sickle and unsickle. The red cell membrane doesn't get damaged. They, as much. they live longer. They live longer. Awesome. And so in the study, what they were looking at was, um, will, this, will this stop, will this decrease hemolysis? and increase your hemoglobin. And that was sort of the main mm -hmm. thrust of the study. And it if you were taking 1,500 milligrams a day, that was enough to increase your hemoglobin in statistically about a gram. So that was, that was what they were studying in the study. And the question is, well, there's a lot of stuff that, the implications of that are beyond just it raised your hemoglobin to ground. That you don't have as much hemolysis, so you don't have as much plasma-free hemoglobin. It doesn't inactivate the NO, and so in the arginase doesn't come out of the red cell. So, so in other words, the red cell doesn't empty its right. like the toxins into your bloodstream that exactly. causes right. further damage. Right. So and hemoglobin. Yeah what they call plasma-free hemoglobin is not good for you. And it's one of the reasons why right. there's a lot of problems with sickle cell and right. inflammation and all this stuff. And so it stops that. And so the implications are that it, it you know, it does more than just increase your hemoglobin gram. And I think, you know, in other studies, you know, somebody, maybe not uh, global blood therapeutics, but some researcher is going to be curious, like, well, you know what? What are the details? And global, I'm sure global blood therapeutics will be interested in that. But that's that's what. The, and so, can you kind of um, talk about like just the outward benefit? What does this mean to a sickle cell patient? Like outwardly, yeah. like does this mean less crisis, less? Yeah. You know, what does it, it mean? It should be. They didn't study that, but it okay. should be that, it, that you have less pain, you have less inflammation. Your NO is higher probably, although this again wasn't in the study, and so that leads to vasodilatation rather than constriction. It it could it would you know it would make a big difference. Outwardly you might have you might have I don't know if you'd notice if you were really anemic, you'd notice if your hemoglobin was seven and it went up to eight, you would notice that. If your hemoglobin was nine that went to ten, you might notice that you have a little more energy control. Mm -hmm. I'm having trouble maintaining a good high hemoglobin. In the past, I've always been in the high eights and nines. Now I'm currently in low sevens, high sixes. I've been on hydroxyurea since 1999 and just started L-glutamine. What else can I do? So she's taking hydroxyurea, she's taking L-glutamine, and her hemoglobin is... Still low. Still low. So the, you know, I'm just the only reason why your hemoglobin would still be low would that's this common would be that your your body is making enough erythropoietin to increase your hemoglobin. So what's erythropoietin? That's the drug or the hormone that is made in your kidneys mm -hmm. that your kidney is kind of weird. Why would your kidney have anything to do with, with your... blood? Yeah. But it does. <laughs> but it, it does. does. Yes. So, your kidney's healthy. Yeah. yeah. So if you so if the the kidneys are able to sense low oxygen and they start making more erythropoietin and that increases your hemoglobin. So if you have kidney disease, 
irregardless of whether you were taking um, L-glutamine, hydroxyurea, or whatever, you still wouldn't have enough erythropoietin to increase your hemoglobin. So that's kind of the obvious thing for this young lady it would be that the reason why her hemoglobin isn't going up is she has some degree of kidney disease or for some reason she's not making enough erythropoietin and her hemoglobin just isn't going up. It could also, you also have, if it's, she's been on, it's, she's been on it since 99. Yeah. So something has changed and it could be, um, you'd have to look at the dose. Is the, is the dose That's too correct. low of hydroxyurea? Although hydroxyurea is eliminated by your kidney. So it's your, if you are adults, generally, even with hydroxyurea, their kidney function decreases a little bit over time. And so it's usually the reverse. It's not that you're, it, with the, that dose has to be reduced as your kidney function goes down. So you're not, don't have toxicity, which also could be a problem. If you're, if you're, if you're taking too much hydroxyurea, you get low reticulocyte counts and low hemoglobin. So it could be that if she's been taking this all this time and they haven't changed her dose, haven't decreased it, she's actually having toxicity from the from hydroxy, hydroxy yeah, itself. Okay. And L-glutamine, nobody really, well, it's not well understood right. how that works. It's an antioxidant, so it does decrease pain. Um, but the details of the biochemistry, people don't know. So the, the, and those two drugs are completely different, so they're really safe to take together. You don't have to worry that they're interacting, I don't think, anyway. Okay. But so I, would, I would look at that. Sounds, it sounds like she should check her kidney function. Why? She should test her kidney function. They should look at her counts, make sure that she doesn't look like she's having hydroxyurea toxicity because her okay. kidney function is a little bit low. And her, it's as though she's taking more hydroxy than she was. And she, she was in, okay. in 1999. I hope that's helpful. I definitely talk yeah. with your doctor. And just remember, this is my advice. Yes. I'm like your grandpa. I'm telling you, I'm just chatting with you, and I'm not trying to tell you what to do. You need to go to your doctor and talk. Your doctor about knows you better than right. I don't know anything does. about you. Yeah. You can see me, but I can't see you. As far as I feel this <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, the next question I have here is, what's the relationship between hydroxyurea and malignant C? Okay. So, hydroxyurea is a chemotherapy agent that has been used for uh, longer than it's been used in sickle cell. I think it started at the turn of the century. It's really old. Um, and so, it's a carcinogen. So, if you have drugs, that affects your DNA and increases your fetal hemoglobin. People worried. Well, you're you're doing something to the to the progenitor cells or the erythroid. What are progenitor cells? The cells that make all the rest of your cells. That's how come you can get a progenitor cell transplant that reconstitutes your platelets, your white count, your red cells. So it's a cell responsible for creating all the rest. Of your all cells. the rest of your cells. Got it. Right? Okay. So. And then there's a there's like a lineage. So it starts off as a progenitor cell, and then some of the cells turn into white cells, platelets, red cells, and then there's all different kinds of white cells, and they are all start from this progenitor cell. Um, so now I forgot what the question was. Um, the difference between hydroxyurea and malignancy. Oh, so if if, a, if some drug affects your um, this lineage or the maturation of your uh, red cells and your other um, cellular elements in your blood, why, what makes you think it's not going to cause cancer? And in rabbits, where they gave a lot of hydroxyurea, like probably a hundred, well, 10 times to at least 10 times or more of hydroxyurea, it was a teratogen. It did cause problems with the baby. Um, but hydroxyurea has been, you know, 19, in, in the, at the end of the uh, 20, 1990s, it was approved, but it had been used in studies since about 1989 or 88 or something like that. So there are people who have been taking hydroxyurea since 1988. 
1989. And those people were in the original studies, and they're still following those people. And there just hasn't been an increase in leukemia or other cancers in people taking hydroxyurea. Hydroxyurea is actually used in other chronic problems. And um, in those people, hydrox those people who take hydroxyurea, there has been an increase in leukemia. So most people would say that the risk is always there because stuff happens in medicine, but the risk is really super low, very, very low. The doses that is given for sickle cell disease. So, okay. Um, let me let's take two more questions. Um, oh, time flies. I'm I know, time, time flies. I think we should yeah. be doing this for longer than an hour. I'm having, Probably too, much, should. I'm having too much fun. Yeah, same, <laughs> same. Um, somebody asked, Silly Locks asks, is there a reason why I'm feeling so much sickle cell pain? My counts are perfect. So her counts don't necessarily reflect. That's what doctors always say. Hey, your blood work looks great. I don't think you're having any pain. So is there a reason why everything looks well, good and she still? Well, because, you know, if your hemoglobin looks fine, but you still have sickle cell disease, you're still sickling. Do you know, this actually, I, this might be a little bit off topic, but let me just vent for a second. I hate what people said. <laughs> I hate when people say, you know, oh, you're having a crisis because you don't drink your water. I'm not having a crisis because I don't drink my water. I'm having a crisis because I have a genetic condition. If you don't drink your water, you're not going to go into a single cell crisis. No, I'm just I mean, kidding. Like, you know, like, as in, like, don't give me an excuse of, oh, why, this, yeah, this right. is why you're sick. Because the reason why I'm sick is because I have, like, a genetic, you know, um, yeah. like, well, I, I have a genetic, you know, like, problem. Or I have a genetic condition. And so, like, I, I get there's such things as triggers or whatnot. But, like, yeah, but it's not necessarily. Yeah, um, the reason why this is happening is because I have a genetic condition. But, it's not because I'm not drinking my water or because I'm out like swimming or you know. It's yeah. not because of that. Well, the you know? thing is, it's why do people it's, say that? I, I, I don't know, <laughs> but it's blaming. It's like taking the. It's blaming the person. For having the disease, so yeah, it, it, it's like trying for, to make me feel irresponsible. Like, yeah. oh, you shouldn't, you shouldn't, you should have been drinking my water, and you wouldn't have gone to crisis. Yeah. No, I'm drinking a lot of water, and yet I still so go I into a, a crisis right, because right. I have a genetic disorder. Right. You know, it's not because I'm not drinking water. Well, so. it's not because you're not drinking water. It's not because you, like, you know, your grandma said never go outside with a sweater and all that yeah. kind of stuff. That, yeah. you know, those things. I mean, if you're dehydrated, you go out in a snowstorm, you're going to probably have, or you jump in a cold pool and swim around, you're probably going to have pain. But that doesn't mean that the person who comes into the emergency room hasn't had a glass of water for two days. You know, yeah. it's ridiculous. But and the other thing is, it's just, to me, it's mean. It's yeah. meanness. You're blaming somebody for a problem. Even, you know, maybe they aren't drinking water. Maybe they are dehydrated. Maybe they did jump into ice. But I bath. still do have a genetic condition. Right. But that yeah. does, or you know what they were doing? You know what the problem with that is? What? Is that they're blaming you for doing something other people can do, and there's no, no consequences. consequences. For, yeah. Like, yeah. you know, which is total baloney. You know, it's yeah. like, why exactly. would you do that to somebody? I mean, it's kind of like, I don't know, um, I, it's not, I wouldn't say it's mean, but it is, it's blaming. Why are you blaming somebody who's suffering for their own suffering, exactly. and, which is ridiculous. Even if you might think that, you know, you might think, oh, this person is normal saline. Yeah. They probably have, but so what? So give them the two liters of normal saline right. or the don't, liter don't or whatever you think it, right? and just yeah. don't say anything. You know? <laughs> I don't know. People always, and I, doctors are probably 
more about this than other people because they know enough to to be the blamer and they know oh you didn't do this you didn't do that. anyway getting back to this person yeah. they you know you're, you still have sickle cell disease you still have and if you're if your hemoglobin is higher like people with alpha thalassemia and sickle cell that doesn't exclude them from having sickle cell pain. Right. i mean their hemoglobin may be between nine and ten all the time they still have pain episodes in fact they have more pain episodes because they have higher hemoglobins and more viscosity and they have increased ADN and some right, other problems. Right. But they don't have they have less there's they're somewhat protected from stroke and some other things. But having a normal counts or high hemoglobin, whatever you, you know, and one thing I learned taking care of people with sickle cell disease is you just things happen that you can't always explain. And and you, yeah. you you just you just have to always things happen you can't explain and sometimes you think one thing is happening but it's something different you just you just have to be hyper vigilant when you are taking care of people with sickle cell disease because that chest pain may look fine on an X ray but it's a pulmonary embolism that doesn't mm. show up on the X ray. Right. Right. So if you investigate a problem and you don't have an answer and you say, oh, you're having chest pain because you didn't drink enough water and the person has a pulmonary embolus, that's yeah. bad medicine. Right. You keep looking, you think to yourself, well, this person's having chest pain, their chest x-ray is completely clear, but their, you know, their O2 sat is not exactly it's a little lower than it should be, then do yeah. a CT, find out whether they have a PE. And if yeah. you still, if that doesn't work, then do something else. Yeah. So you figure it out. So, Don't assume, the other thing is people assume, oh, this person is just ironic or catastrophizing, mm -hmm. and they're not really as sick as, right. as they yeah. think Pain they is never are. believed, right? Yeah, um, and you can't measure it and you can't see it. So, yeah, there is no... There's no way. You could, your labs could look perfect. Right. And and you know, there's just no there's no, no test way for pain. For there's pain, no pain or some complicated, you know. Yeah. So that's not even really anything that can be solved. I mean, it just needs to be education with doctors. Right. And well, and doctors just have to be more vigilant when they have a patient with sickle cells. So if a kid comes in, his temperature is 100, it's three months old, and his temperature is 102, and the brother has a cold, you don't say, "Oh, you just got a cold too. Go home." That yeah. kid used to die all the time because of that. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so that's you know a little One advice to the last people. question, and we may cut out on Instagram because I think we're on our one-hour limit. If we cut out on Instagram, I'm sorry. We're still on Facebook. We'll ask one more question, okay. and then we'll wrap this up. Um, question on postpriapism, partial. Mm -hmm erectile dysfunction what are options of a better erectile function so this person had priapism yeah. had damage from right. having priapism and has a partial uh, erect, erectile yeah, erect, dysfunction right. what, are, what are their options that's a urology question I'm not sure what the there are options but um, it depends on how bad it is and how they feel about it. Um, but there are op options for, but they're surgical for um, sequelae of having priapism. Um, the reason why, you know, my understanding anyway, the reason why you have this problem is because if you've had recurring priapism, you have scar tissue. And the way you have an erection is you have this spongy, tissue that fills up with blood and that gives you an erection and then it goes away and you don't have an erection but if you have scarring in there that scar tissue makes it so that you never look like you're not having an erection some degree of erection um, and i'm not sure you, I, I would really like recommend i would really recommend going to see a good urologist not you know, somebody yeah. that that you you talk to your friends, although it's hard to talk to your other sickle cell buddies about a problem like this, but, and you'll find out that somebody you know 
who has never told you also has had priapism, and they may have had to go to a urologist. And they might say, you know, I went to three urologists, and they all sucked except for Dr. So-and-so, and that's the person you go to. Um, they have to have some understanding of sickle cell disease and the complications of sickle cell disease. But basically, you know, this does happen to other other people for different reasons. But sickle cell disease is always unique. You always have to go to somebody who knows something about sickle cell or your hematologist or your primary care person who knows a lot about sickle cell will educate that urologist about what's going on. But it's a surgical issue, unfortunately. Okay. I know, yeah, um, from somebody who submitted a, a warrior story um, to Sickle Cell 101, um, did get a surgical, um, right. they, they, they saw a, a really good urologist. So, um, yeah, and, I mean, the yeah. results, the other thing you have to think, this doesn't mean you're impotent, you can't have children, all that kind of stuff. That's a different story. So, um, but you, but the, you need to talk to a urologist. And whenever you go to talk to any surgeon about anything, ask them about the side effects. What's okay. So you're going to fix this, but what's going to, what could happen or, or what's known to happen after the surgery so that there's no surprises. Right. You know, you don't wake up and, oh, I forgot to tell you that, but you know, well, I bet the cat's out of the bag at that point. Yeah. You know? Okay. Thank you all so Thank much you so for your much. questions. They're really great. I hope remember, you enjoyed the session. Oh, this Dr. Is, Q has to give a disclaimer here. This, I'm not trying to cure your disease. I'm not trying to diagnose anything. I'm giving you advice. I don't know anything about you. I don't know anything at all. It, and if you, you can take what the advice I've given you and take it to your doctor and say, hey, Dr. Q told me this, and maybe your doctor will say, well, that guy doesn't know what he's talking about, which is fine with me. And, <laughs> <laughs> but you, but I'm, not, I'm not your doctor. So make sure that if you have heard something on this uh, little segment that applies to you, and you're wondering how much it applies to you or whether it really does, then you need to go see your doctor. Don't, I'm not, I'm just the advice giver. All right. Okay. Thank you guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take it easy.